Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to our, not only our Thursday night service here at Hagwich, but the start of our uh, 122nd workshop. Wow. You know, where have all these days gone? Praise the Lord uh, that you're here tonight. Praise the Lord that we're here tonight. Uh, and I'm uh, going to pray and ask the Father in Jesus' name to put us in one mind, one heart, one accord, and one faith uh, as we travel through the Word of God tonight the title of this message is called dismantling satan's will within our lives i'm uh, going to open up first over in second timothy chapter two if you have your bibles with you uh, please feel free to open up to verse 20 second timothy chapter two uh, verse 20 uh, the apostle paul obviously is writing here and he says in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, that's us by the way, gold and silver, uh, but also wood and of the earth, and that's of course the worldly things, which don't belong in the church by the way, uh, and uh, there are some to honor and some to dishonor. I think it's the Living Bible, uh, Ken Taylor's version of the Living Bible. I think uh, when it says dishonor, I think he replaced that with uh, some people can be a flower pot. Some people can be a toilet. Uh, and that's our choice, by the way. That's Romans 6.16. To whomsoever we give ourselves over, servants to obey his servants we are, to whom we obey, whether of sin or death, or of obedience unto righteousness, whether it's through the Lord or through Satan. We have volition. We don't have total free will, but we do have volition to make decisions and choices in our life. And thank God that our, that our salvation is secure and being held in the Father's hand and the Savior's hand. And nothing can take that out of either one of those hands. And we, when we became born again, Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. That faith was not of ourselves. It was a gift from God, lest we should boast and say that, you know, God and I, God and us, we had something to do with it. So God gave us enough faith to take us from hell to heaven. Now, we work out our salvation in between. that. We're going to heaven whether you like it or not. You're going to go to heaven. And uh, if you want to talk to me after the service, because if, if you're on that treadmill of loss of salvation, wow, what a horrible set of demons those things are. You'll, you'll never get off that treadmill until you come to that saving knowledge that Jesus did it all. Yes, you say we're not worth it. That's or you know we're not worthy. That's right. That's why the Lord saved us. Sometimes we go before the Lord and say, you know, Lord, I just don't, I just I'm not I just don't know. But and the Lord says, yeah, that's why I saved you, Lord. But why me? Well, you know, that's why I saved you. But I'm not I'm not worth it. I'm not you know. And the Lord says, yeah, but I saved you anyway. Once you become born again, you know, Jesus used the only example that man could never refute when Nicodemus came to him at night and said how can a, how can somebody be born again how can a man how can a person go back inside the mother's womb and you can check every national Enquirer, the sun all these rags that are at the uh, supermarket as you're waiting uh, to check out and you'll never see a story about a baby going back inside the mother's womb ever because it can't happen and Jesus said, that's right. He says, because what's born of the flesh is flesh, and what's born of the spirit is spirit. So once you become born again, you're saved. You belong to the Lord. And there's a lot of hypotheticals that people thought, well, what about this, what about that? I don't deal with the hypotheticals because I can ask just the opposite of that. Just hold on that, that you're saved and get to that place. Make sure that helmet of salvation that you have on your head is fitting uh, correctly. And so he says that there are some to honor, some to dishonor. Paul says in verse 21, he says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he's going to be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet or fit for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. So we see that we have to purge ourselves from these things. We have to find out what these things are first from the word of God, because today in Christianity, almost anything goes. You can go into any Christian bookstore and you can find a book that'll tell you if you want to be 
a practicing homosexual Christian, you can do that. If you want to be a pedophiling Christian, you can do that. If you want to suck down alcohol, you can do that. If you want to, you know, uh, have this, that, or the other thing in your life, there's a book out there for you. But that's all wrong. All that stuff is poison in our lives as believers. All those things are anchors in our Christianity that slow us down or stop us, or sometimes they even uh, cause our spiritual growth and progress to go backwards. Alcohol is not for the believer. It is poison, period. And I know all the scientists out there, just you know, one or two glasses of wine. Listen, if, P, if you drink wine, just admit that you like to drink. Okay? There's no health benefits in that. The poison that's in the alcohol does a lot worse than, than what the grape does. Just, just buy Welch's grape juice. You'll get a lot more out of that than buying uh, the alcohol. You know, if you want to smoke pot today in the church, it's okay. You know, there, there are churches out there today that are toking the spirit. Toke the spirit. You can do anything, and it, it attracts a lot of people, but what does the Bible say to us about being in one mind, one heart, and one accord? So if we purge ourselves of these things, and I'll be talking about uh, some of these things in a little bit, uh, we're going to be vessels of honor. We all want to be a vessel of honor, sanctified, set apart, meet, fit for Jesus to be able to use us, because that's the problem today in the church. The church is dead. The, the pulpits are silent. The pastors have, have whatever, capitulated. Very smart people. Very, and a lot of them have gone to Bible college. Many of them have gone to a seminary or some type of extra uh, type of teaching. Yet you never hear anything about demons from them. You never hear any teachings about deliverance. You don't hear anything about that, what shall it profit a man if we gain the whole world and lose our own soul? You know, over in Proverbs chapter uh chapter 7, I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 7, God says he restores our soul. Isn't that cool? Well, why? What, what, what needs to be restored of our soul? See, the soul is the way we, basically, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act, and the way we react. And we, when we became born again, God didn't say, okay, he wants us all to be, now we're individuals to him in our walk, but we're all one in the Holy Spirit in Christ. And the Bible teaches us how to think, how to feel, how to act, and how to react at things that are going on around us. But when these, when these things aren't taught, then we've got fragmentation throughout the church. You know, and that's why we have a denominational system that's out there. It effectively keeps the church separate it. It'll never be able to come together with all these different doctrines and teachings out there. And don't think that that's not important. Jesus said in John uh, 7 38, he says, we've got to believe on him as the word of God states, not as the pastor, not as the seminary, not as the teaching, the book that's written, uh, you know, the, the CD or DVD that people are watching or listening to. We've got to believe on Jesus as the word of God states. And then out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. This, he said, was in reference to the Holy Spirit. Over in Galatians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul tells us twice that if somebody else comes and preaches a different doctrine than the ones that they laid down, let them be, let them be cut off and sent to hell. Look it up. That's a really serious thing, brothers and sisters. You know, God didn't save us and say, well, just do whatever you want. You know, in the Old Testament, when he, when he was going to travel in that tabernacle, he came to Moses. He says, I want things like this. I want them like this. I want this length. I want this width. I want this material. And, you know, Moses was a real smart guy. You know, he could have come back and gone to God and said, you know what? If we do this over here and we shorten these ropes over here and lengthen them over here and do the, we could probably save a lot of money. We could save a lot of time. God's not interested in that. He told Moses to build that tab tabernacle according to pattern. He gave to Aaron how all the utensils that were going to be used in that. He told, he told Aaron how to make them, what they're to be made out of, how big they're supposed to be, you know, the dimensions of them. And he told Aaron, 
I want you to make these things the way I told you to. See, God's not interested in this, in this Cain, do-it-yourself religion that we have out there today. You know, when Abel brought his sacrifice to God, it's not something that you and I would bring. It, it was an old, it was a stinky sacrifice that by the time, who knows how much time had passed from uh, when, he, when he cut that throat or whatever, whatever that sacrifice was. It was bloody. There were probably flies all around and it stunk. And that's not something that, you know, God, we don't think that God would accept those types of things. But when Cain brought the works of his hands, he was a farmer. So whatever he brought was probably very pretty. He probably spit shined it, made it look really good. And God said, I reject that because that's not what I want. Uh, I used the example. I used it not too long ago here in the church. You know, almost everybody likes apple pie. So in our lives, we're sending apple pies to God. Just one after another because everybody likes apple pies. When we get to heaven, we look at God and say, Hey, what do you think of those apple pies? And God's going to say, well, I like cherry. See, this was the problem that Job's friends had. You know, Job's friends knew God. Job's friends often gave Job good advice. But they never bothered to check with God to see what God was doing. And that's what happens in the church today. So many of us follow the leader, not Jesus, but the pastor. How many times people I've talked to over the years that uh, you ask them, well, my church believes this. My pastor believes this. My pastor teaches this. Not so much coming from the word of God, but what the church is teaching. But how is Jesus in our life today? Where is Jesus Christ in our life today? So he says we're going to be meat for the master's use, prepared for every good work. So we need to flee also youthful lusts. Follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call upon the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Because the church is stuffed to the rafters with those that call upon the name of the Lord from not a pure heart. The churches are stuffed to the rafters with unsaved people. I was in a big Baptist church once, 7,000 people in there. I knew the pastor. And he's preaching, and he estimated that half his church, this is a Southern Baptist Convention church, SBC church. He estimated that, that over 50% of his church wasn't saved. For a Baptist to say that, half of those 7,000, he didn't think, knew the Lord. Wow. So he says we need to follow, and, uh, follow them, call upon the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. He says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid because all they do is gender strifes. And we have that today. You know, when, when the Internet came to life, Satan put a bullhorn in a lot of Christians' hands, and they all started to have these blogs all these teachings out there. This is what the Lord's showing me about the Bible. This is what the Lord's showing me about the Bible. And they're all teaching things that are contrary. So many of them are teaching things contrary to the Word of God. I, I think the whole church has gotten, has, has become schizophrenic. You know, we're supposed to have, uh, Paul says that the, um, the body of Christ uh, should be one, that it should be fitly joined together. But in my mind, this is, I look at the church, and the church is having epileptic seizures. Because everybody's teaching a different doctrine. And where is deliverance today in the church? These very smart preachers that are out there, we all know their names. We listen to them. I love them. But if I ever had an opportunity to talk to them, I'd ask them why they don't teach on deliverance. When Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe, in his name cast out devils, where is that today? You know, it took up a full one-third of Jesus' ministry, yet it's never talked about today. Because if the pastor up front looks at his church and says, you know what, y'all got demons, do you know what would happen? The people would run up and say, what are we going to do about that? But they don't want to do anything about it. I don't know why. You know, I, I'm beginning to get a little cynical. I'm beginning to wonder if so many of these very smart, 
well-schooled people that are out there that we love if they've been bought off, if they've capitulated. You know, if you read uh, Battling the Hosts of Hell, early on, Pastor Worley writes how the demons came to him at night. While he'd just gotten home from a meeting, he laid down. These demons appeared, and they offered him everything. They offered him money, women, fame, fortune, but he had to pull the books. And if you've read, if you've read Battling, you, he said no. And they said, "Word, if you don't, if you don't do this, we're going to rip your church to pieces." He says, "If it'll rip, let it rip," and it ripped all over the place. The demons have a lot of inroads in churches. So he says, "Flee, flee also youthful lust. Follow after uh, faith and charity, peace." Uh, foolish and unlearned questions avoid because all they do is gender strife. Because the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle, and uh, be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, to teach, not to instruct, not to tell people that something has to be a certain way. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. We plant the seed, we take the word of the Lord, and we present it. We don't have to dust it off. We don't have to shine it. We don't have to do anything with it except just present it the way it says and then let the Holy Spirit, we, we don't have to use voice inflection. We just have to speak the truth in Christ to, to the best of our ability from, from our hearts and the Lord takes it from there. So he said we need to be apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You know what that means, those who oppose themselves? Those that are talking about things that they don't know what they're talking about. They're quoting from the Word of God. They're quoting from things that they think they know about the Word of God that the Lord's not in. You remember back in Ezekiel when um, God's people, they were actually trying to follow the law. They were trying to follow the holy days, uh, the feast days. They were trying to, you know, bring their uh, bring their service, uh, bring their uh, sacrifices to uh, uh, the priests, and so they could do their service. Uh, and they had their solemn meetings. Oh Lord, we just love you so much. And God says, "Get that stuff away from me." He says, "It's a stench to my nostrils." He says, "Who asked you to do this?" And God's people are like, oh, hamna, hamna, hamna. And the reason why is because it was rogue to them. Just like today. You, you know, it's funny now that we've gotten past some of this uh, COVID stuff in the church. COVID has effectively destroyed a lot of good churches. Because a lot of people aren't coming back. I've talked to people. I've listened to people talk. They stay at home because all churches Zoom now or, or, or Skype or, you know, they do something. It's easy to get lazy. See, if we don't labor to enter into God's rest, we're going to get lazy with our Christianity. And now is not the time to get lazy. Now is the time for us to gird ourselves up and do what we can to bind the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. So the servant of the Lord must not strive, be gentle, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that don't really know what they're talking about, because God may, peradventure, give them repentance, just like he's done with us many times, to the acknowledging of the truth. See, we've got to acknowledge the truth from the God's word. You know, over in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, tell, Paul tells us that we can't do anything against the truth, we can only do things for the truth. So we need to know what the truth is, what the Bible says about itself, what the Bible says about these different doctrines that are out there, what the Bible tells us about how we're to live our lives, and then we draw nigh unto God, and he then starts to draw nigh unto us. So many are waiting, Lord, I'm waiting on you, Lord, I'm waiting. The Lord's waiting on us. He's already given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through Jesus Christ. 
He's given us a name that's above every name. That's the name of Jesus Christ. He daily loads us down with benefits. He gives us promises that that good work that he started in us, he's going to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. All the promises are yea, amen. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Listen, we're winners. We've already got it. We're, we're more than conquerors. How, how can you be more than a conqueror? See, if you're a conqueror, you're a winner. In Christ, we're more than conquerors. Yet we walk around defeated. We walk around giving the devil. Now listen, I, I talk about the devil a lot. The Bible does, by the way. I talk a lot about things that the devil can do. This is where the, this is where the church has really missed it. These demons that are out there, they're experts at ruining your life, at ruining your children. They hate you. With, the, with, the, with as beautiful as Lucifer was in heaven. He's 180 now, just as beautiful as he was. He and those demons are ugly. And when I mean ugly, I'm talking about they're, they're insane. They hate God. They hate everything about God. See, that's why the Word of God teaches us that Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you too. Because, And so many Christians, we're so, we're so wrapped up in our, oh, that person doesn't like me. So what? Does the Lord like us? Who, who feeds us? Who gives us our daily bread? The Lord does. All, everything that we need from, for our lives to live a godly life in Jesus Christ come on a daily basis, give us this day our daily bread. God is a God of an economy. God doesn't want us to give us things for the next day. That's, that molds for us. Just when Jesus said he was that manna that fell in the Old Testament, he, we're fed today by that same manna, which is Jesus Christ. And he gives us everything we need. Sufficient unto our day today is the evil going on, the Bible says. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be there if we, if we wake up. If we don't wake up, praise the Lord, then we're, some, then we're somewhere else. Then we're in heaven. But sufficient unto right now is the evil that you and I, that all of us have going on in our life. And the word, the word of God teaches us how to get over on these things, how to get on top of them. And even if, they don't, even if some of these things don't leave our lives, the Lord protects us. He, he guides us. He leads us. He does everything he can for us to have our faith in front of us. So there are those that oppose, that oppose themselves. If God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth so that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by the devil at the devil's will. What? You know, these demons can't just jump on us. You know that? We don't ever have to worry about demons. And if you're in a church that's praying deliverance, uh, now in the opening prayer, I'll pray, Father, take them to wherever Jesus wants them to go. But other than that, you don't have to worry about them going to some other place. Jesus will take care of all that. Demons just can't jump on us. The curse causes shall not come. Of course, now maybe we've got holes in our umbrella. You know, maybe, maybe most of our life is wrapped up in the world and, and we're watching Christians around us grow. We're watching Christians around us being blessed with wisdom, knowledge, understanding, direction, discernment, and discretion, and we're not getting it. Well, then we need deliverance. We need to repent. We need to change our ways. Because many in the church are taken captive by Satan at his will. And why is that? because our wills line up with his. What a horrible thing to go before the Lord or for the Lord to flag us one day and say, you know, a lot of your will is lining up with the devil. Pretty embarrassing. Over in Mark chapter 8, in verse 31, Jesus was teaching. Uh, he had his disciples around and he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and then be killed and then rise again. His disciples are around him. And he spoke that saying openly. But Peter took him to the side and began to rebuke him. Uh, verse 33 
But when he had turned about, when Jesus had turned about, he looked on all his disciples. He then rebuked Peter. And he said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Peter's will was taken captive by the devil. Now this, this happens to all of us. There's none of us that are you know, totally immune of these things. You know, we try and do right. We try and walk with the Lord. But if our feet slip from under us, it might open us up to a demon. Now, many times that'll just, you know, when we say, Father, in Jesus' name, I confess that it is sin, those things will leave. Sometimes we might need to do some self-deliverance. Sometimes we may have to go somewhere and get deliverance, which is fine. But at least it's available out there. But in the church today, the churches, people have, they're on, they're on antidepressants. They're on all different kinds of medication for this, that, and the other thing. There's not a country in the world like the United States. Uh, we take more antidepressants and uh, what do they call them, those psychotropics than the rest of the countries put together in the world. We do that here in the United States. And so when you go to your pastor in a lot of churches, you say, I've got this problem. Well, they send you the counselor so that you can talk to somebody about the problem and they can tell you like if you have an anger problem they'll direct you to some anger management so you can read a book or go to a class where they can tell you that it's not good to have anger that the Bible tells you that you can be angry but you shouldn't sin and then they pat you on the back and I know this is a fact and they pat you on the back and send you home and those demons laugh all the way to hell you can't counsel a demon out if you have an anger problem, those spirits have got to be cast out in Jesus' name. Now, God can sovereignly deliver us of anything he wants. But other than that, God gave us one remedy for evil spirits. We have it on the wall over there. These signs shall follow them that believe. In his name, cast out devils. And these are words that we have to speak. We can't wish them out. We can't blow them out. We can't wave our coats like, like Benny Hinn used to do and all these other people dig imaginary holes and put our demons in them. Listen, they're not going anywhere. They don't want to go anywhere. They like living inside of us. They, that's what their job is. They love harassing us. They love hurting us. They love hurting our children. They love breaking up our marriages. They, they love ruining our jobs they love to get us hooked on this that and the other thing that's out there and the world's more than willing to accommodate all these things so he told peter he says get thee behind me satan you savor not the things that be of god but the things that be of man now do you know that you know i know that uh i used to be uh, I, I cut out most sports in my christian walk uh, years ago but I loved, there was one sport that I loved, and I just loved it, loved it, loved it, and I watched every game I could, and I rooted for my team, and when my team would score, I'd jump up out of my chair, yeah, you know, I'm, yeah. and uh, one day the Lord says, you know, you don't do that for me. And it wasn't just one day he told me that. And then one day the Lord gave me the grace, just like when I had that drug abuse in my life. I confessed it as sin. I said, Lord, I don't want anything to do with it anymore. He took it. I don't miss it. You know, it's, I don't sit there and go, oh, I really want, oh, yeah, you know, I'm trying not to. The Lord just took it away from me. Because, you know, in heaven, there's not one sports score that's ever going to be mentioned, ever. Not one goal, not, not one home run, not one anything is ever, ever. It, it, in fact, it's not going to be in our wheelhouse to be able to even think that. We're going to be changed. We see through this glass darkly now. But then when we see the Lord face to face when we die, we're going to see him as he is and be just like him. Now, we won't be Jesus, but we won't have those thoughts anymore. Those thoughts will not be allowed in heaven. Not one thing man has ever done except for Jesus Christ, the man Jesus Christ, are the only things that are ever going to be mentioned in heaven. Other than that, no man, no flesh is going to glorify itself in the sight of God, the Bible says. 
it kind of changes a lot of the way we live our life down here on earth. We've got all these ground wires holding us down. We, we have a desire. The spirit is warring against the flesh. The flesh is warring against the spirit. Both are contrary one to another, so we can't do the things that we really want to do. But our allegiance, our ungodly soul ties, are with things of the world. Satan is the god of this world. Jesus, the, you know, when, uh, when they came to Jesus and they said, hey, you know this social gospel that's out there? Oh, things are, oh, people are just so bad. People have always been bad. We're born lost. We're born dead. Okay, that's how bad things are. Every person on earth is born into sin. And when they came to Jesus and they said, hey, don't you care that Pilate is mingling the blood of the Galileans? What are you going to do about that? I, I think we need to form a committee or we need, to, we need to form a group of people to go check into this because some bad things are happening to those Galileans. And I don't know what the mingling of the blood is, but it sounds like the occult to me. Jesus, don't you care about that? And all Jesus said was, unless you repent, you too shall perish. So how about that tower of Siloam that fell? Don't you care about that, Jesus? Don't you know that these people died and they were fathers, they were husbands, they were, they were somebody's son and, and they died and because they used bad, uh, uh, they used, uh, you know, bad uh, uh, materials and they didn't do this right and, you know, we need to form this, we need to get this group together and make sure all this stuff is done right. Don't you care about that, Jesus? And all he said was, except you repent, you too sh shall likewise perish. See, the word of God really cuts close to the things that the Lord wants us to focus on. So he goes on here. Uh, he says, when he re after he rebuked people, uh, he says, you think not things of the Lord, but things of man. And so when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself. And that's where deliverance comes in. Because many of us, me included, I, I'm at the front of the line, we're bound to things sometimes. You know, when you, when you go through, there's teachings in, in the book room, if you're not familiar with the doctrines of binding and loosing, we can be bound with words that we use. We can put curses on ourselves. We can, uh, aff affections that we have, we can form ungodly soul ties to these things. And this binds us to these things. And we, we can't seem to get some of this stuff out of our lives. You know, Lord, I know it's wrong. Lord, I don't want it in my life. But we've made an agreement with that. We've got to break that agreement in Jesus' name. Sometimes we've got, we've got to break a curse maybe that may, that may be with it. Maybe we need deliverance from it. These, this is spiritual warfare. This is what the, when, when we read about that in the Old Testament, uh, people were, were uh, held, held in with cords of vanity. You know what vanity is? Worthlessness, nothing. So many today in the church are just spinning their wheels and going nowhere. Of course, they go to the Sunday school, and of course, they put their children uh, in, the, uh, in the nursery. Your children belong with you, brother and sister. Okay? They belong, they should sit with you in the pew. Uh, you've got this class for those that are single, those that want to be single, you know, for this problem and that problem. And all these, all these classes do, instead of casting these demons out, they just tell people it's going to be okay. But it's not going to be okay. Because these demons never leave unless you cast them out in Jesus name and they're like bird dogs they will just sit there and they will wait and they will wait for that golden opportunity to ruin our walk with the Lord to ruin our testimony with the Lord and they've got to be dealt with they can't be left alone in our lives so whosoever will come after me let him deny himself take up, take up his cross and follow me for whosoever will save his life shall lose it but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake is going to save it. Because what shall it profit a man 
if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. But what's worse than that is the second part of that. What shall we give in exchange for our soul? Many times, because we have vagabond spirits, the wanderer, many other things going on in our lives, demons that we've not dealt with, we have a very weak walk with the Lord. We don't, you know, we don't, we have such a hard time. We go from Bible to Bible, relationship to relationship, church to church, uh, thought to thought. You know, I thank God uh, for deliverance for this church, for Pastor Worley. I, you know, the Word of God is true. The Word of God, it goes forward. It will not come back void. It will accomplish those things that it's supposed to do. And we can trust the Word of God. We can hold on to the Word of God. You know, when we get stuck in between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, and we start thinking about that there's a gap theory out there, and we've got all these things that were going on uh, before where Adam swam with the fish and flew with the birds and all these things that are going on and how, you know, the, 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 what, what about the giants today? You know, well, so, of course, we pick up the Douay version of the Bible so we can get the book of Enoch. And you know what? Before we read Enoch and Maccabees and some of these other uh, books that are not in the canon, not in the true Bible, maybe we ought to get to know our Bible. Maybe we ought to get to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and not all these other Jesus that are out there. They've got to have, they've got to have, you see the Catholic Church now, and, you know, UFOs, they're coming, man. They're just demons. There's no extraterrestrial out there except for Jesus. And if there was intelligent life out there, it would, it would pass us up. It would come close to us and say, give us, give us the sniff test, and, and they'd move on. There are no aliens out there. Well, that was going to be a bad joke, so I'll move on. You know, there are no UFOs. The, the things that you're, the things that they're going to be seen and they're going to prove them. The Bible says they're going to prove them. You know, Satan has ministers of righteousness out there, and they look really good, and they talk really good, and they say a lot of good things, and they smile a lot, and they're very successful. And and how how do we know that they're okay? Because they have evidence. They have um, they get results. Well, so did Moses. Now, he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. When Moses said, Lord, your people need water, he's all mad. God says, well, talk to the rock. And Moses, he was so upset, he smacked that rock. That water came, the results came. But Moses was not allowed then to go into the promised land because of rebellion. See, God means what he says and says what he means. And he knows we're going to drop the ball. He knows we're going to fail a thousand times to nothing. But he's hoping that we're going to pick up that ball. He's hoping that we're going to recover ourselves from the snare of a devil who are being taken captive by the devil at the devil's will. Our lives far too often are tied in to this world system and the politics that are out there. Jesus doesn't care about the politics. Don't worry about the politics. Say, well, we need to get those conservatives in. They're as, they're as bad. Listen, the conservatives, the liberals, they'll mug you in front of the alley. At, at, least, at least the conservatives, they'll take you down the alley and then mug you. Oh, we just need to vote Christians in and ruin that Christian's life. We need to stay. That's all the world. Jesus has nothing to do with this world, brothers and sisters. I know people are saying this, that, oh, this, you know, and all this Christianity stuff that's going on in politics. Baloney, anywhere you slice it. Unless these leaders are calling the church and people to repentance, it doesn't mean anything. Talk, 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 nothing ever happens. If we're going to talk, let's talk. Ephesians, Ephesians 3.10 tells us that it's the church's responsibility, that's us, to let the principalities and powers in heavenly places know the manifold wisdom of God. Just as Jesus spoke back to the devil, get thee behind me, Satan, the Lord wants us to do the same thing. When, when was the last time the devil was ever talked to about anything? 
most churches won't even, won't even talk about him because they're afraid. Oh, well, he scares people. He should scare people. This guy is a very formidable enemy. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We've got to come out of agreement with so many things that are out there. So Jesus said, what shall, and what shall man give in exchange for his soul? We, we trade things of our mind, our wills, and our emotions. And of course, then we have to take this vitamin, that vitamin. We have to you know, take this antidepressant. We have to take this set of pills because we're not all there. We, we can be there spiritually. Listen, God, God wants strong Christians. God wants men and women. Listen, we're equal with God in, um, uh, in who we are in Christ. But in our gender, you know, each one of our genders, there's only two of them, by the way, uh, and you can't change that. You can wish and change your uh, birth certificate if you want, but that's not going to change your, your biology of who you really are. You are who you are. And each gender, the Bible teaches us that we have responsibilities to do. One blesses the other one. One strengthens the other one. And then being in agreement with the Holy Spirit, that threefold cord, that threefold cord is not easily broken. And the devil has a lot of threefold cords out there. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. There's many of them. Well, there are many. There's several that are talked about in the Bible that a lot of Christians are bound down with. Why? Because the church isn't saying anything. And the world is never going to say anything. The world is never going to promote uh, over in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 1. God said that uh, in the wisdom of God, God made sure that in, in his, you know, I can quote it after the service, but uh, for the service here, uh, the Lord says, uh, for that, uh, this is verse 21 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom knew not God, because it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, that's what I'm doing up here, the foolishness of preaching, hopefully not foolish preaching, to save them that believe. You won't find Jesus in the world. You won't find him in the universities. You'll find things about him, but those are just words. See, our life comes, these are words of life that are real for us. And when we come into agreement, when we draw nigh unto God, he draws nigh unto us. When we resist the devil, he flees, but we've got to resist him. We've got to fi find out, uh, we have it back on the wall, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing in captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We're, we're, the, we're the bullhorn now for the Lord. We're the ones that are to carry forth this message so that others can know that there's help. Real quick, because I have just a couple minutes left here. You know, over in, over in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26, you know, it's amazing today of, you know, we can get a tummy tuck, we can get cold, what do they call it? A cold something you know if you want to I got a little waddle going on here now and and you know I'm sorry that you know I know God created a lot of beautiful people but he had to put hair on the rest so I know that you know all of you people that have, all you men out there that have hair you know I know you're jealous but I can't help it this is this is how I was born yeah and there's people spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars trying to change their life trying to save their life trying to do things to improve their life I'm talking about Christians, yet they don't invest in the spiritual side of that. Because God says in verse one, uh, chapter uh, Genesis 1, 26, God said, Let us make man in our image uh, after our likeness. And the next verse tells us, So God created man in his image. The image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so God created us to be like him. God didn't create us to be uh, the old saying here in Chicago, to be like Mike. God didn't create us to be like our old president. You know, I liked him. 
I think I thought he did a lot of good things, but I don't know. I don't know about a lot of other things. You know, Jesus didn't commit himself unto man. You remember why? Because he says, "I know what's in man. There's evil in all of us." On our best day, if we were to put all of our righteousness together, you know, and we're all in, in a big bus and we're going downhill, it's a convertible bus, and the sun's to our back and beautiful day, and all of our righteousness is on that bus, it would still stink before God. Because there's only one thing that will, that will uh, there's only one life that will soon be passed, only what's done for Jesus will last. So we're made in the image of God. God didn't ask, God didn't create us to be something that we're not. And, and you know, we have low self-esteem. Oh, you know, now, the Bible says we shouldn't hate ourselves because Jesus loved us enough to save us. Okay, so we most certainly cannot like a lot of the things that we allow in our flesh. But a lot of people, a lot of Christians, they don't like themselves. And so they walk around all bummed out and they go to counseling after counseling after counseling for somebody to tell us, well, it wasn't really our fault. It was the way you were born. It was the way your parents raised you. It was the side of the tracks that, that, you, that you grew up at. Yeah, isn't it interesting that when Jesus dealt with the gathering demoniac, he didn't come up to him and say, wow, you've had a tough life. Look at you. You're all cut up. You got chains on you. You're naked. You live in a cave. Man, you, you must have had a really tough life. He didn't say that, did he? He took the ax to the root, got him saved, put him back in his right mind. See, the Lord wants us in our right minds. But when, when our affinity, when our, when our desires are for so many other things, the latest, the latest style that's out there, style, do you know that once every two or three years, I read this on a plane of all things, all the clothiers, not, not the independents, but all the big clothiers get together once every two or three years. They all get together, all of them, all the enemies, they become friends because they already are friends. And they conspire. It's a conspiracy. What the next set of fashions are going to be, and then they all follow that. It's 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 a dog and pony show. Nobody's coming up with stuff on their own. They're all doing the same thing. They all get together, and it's not that's not just with clothing. We should be careful of the clothing that we wear. A lot of people are wearing. From, you know, my people do this, and my people do that. Listen, I'm your people, and you're my people. Our life now, we are dead and our life is now hid with Christ and God. Old things have passed away. Everything else has become new. And as Christians, we need to get on this boat and find out what the Bible says about who we are. Because we're all, we're all the same. There's not one of us that's any different before the Lord. And this, um, I think it's Serapius that I talk about. Uh, in the prayers, that's that's the ruling spirit over what they call this is from the New Age movement. Okay, that's what they call racial evolution. That thing's done a good job at destroying things. The country, and it's not it's not just with our cultures. It's it's with everything. It's so fragmented. There are everything's just broken up. The foundations are now gone. The only thing that we have left is the Word of God. And I was so discouraged when, uh, you know, as we were coming out of COVID, and I'm just thinking, man, you know, what's the church going to be like? And, and, and there are a lot of problems in the church. But there's a lot of Christians who are waking up. There's a lot of believers out there that, that know they're not getting help from the garden variety church that's out there. Like, like most people that end up in deliverance, you know, if they're, if they're, um, if they've been to school, or they'll tell you, I always knew there was more. I always knew there was more to the Word of God because once you get in deliverance, once you get in real deliverance, real spiritual warfare, the whole Word of God takes a whole new light. It 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 just radically changes. But people have to believe that Christians can have demons. Can you believe it? We live in 
in 2021 and still today all these great minds that are out there don't believe that a demon can be inside of a Christian I've traveled the earth and every time in that when I get to that part of the teaching I'll say why why can a demon it, it out of all the things that I teach in deliverance that would always be the most con that would be the one most controversial so why you know why uh, why can a Christian not have a demon well because it can't live in the same body as the Holy Spirit it's the only answer from the four corners of the earth that I've been to it's always the same answer okay, and these are smart people and these are these are people who supposedly know the Bible yet the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5 that we are 100% body, we are 100% soul, and we are 100% spirit. When we become born again, our spirit is the thing that gets saved. Our soul does not get saved. The body does not get saved. And those demons can't touch that spirit. They live in the flesh. Where does sin live in our bodies? In the flesh. Same place that the demons do. So yes, a demon can be inside of the body of somebody who's born again. I, it's just so elementary. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. it. I mean, it's almost like they've been bought off or something, you know, that, that they don't touch some of these doctrines that are out there. So I know this is kind of a big pill, but the Lord is looking for us, for us to radically change the way our Christianity is because we're not going to get it in organizations we're not going to get it in newsletters we're not going to get it in people's blogs almost everybody has an ulterior motive of why they're telling us stuff most of the time there's a, the hook is money but a lot of other times people just want to be recognized we want a name why? Well, I mean, who were we? We were nothing, nobodies when we got saved. We're just, and so now we're just sinners now, saved by grace. We don't need a name. People got to have name tags and you know, or, or name plates. And you go in some of these churches. You know, there's one not too far from here. On every door, there's a name tag. Prophet this, prophet, and the prophets. They're not even the whole the whole thing of prophets today is not from the Old Testament. It's not the same. The fivefold ministry is all of us. Evangelist, teacher, prophet, all that. We all ebb and flow in the fivefold ministry every single day in our lives. Sometimes the Lord blesses us to say something and it comes out as a prophecy. Well, we're not a prophet. We're just Christians. And and then maybe we're trying to teach somebody, well then we're a teacher. Or maybe we're preaching something about G. Well, then we're an evangelist. We don't have to get a we don't have to get a business card, tell people who we are. The Lord knows who we are, and brothers and sisters, that's what He's looking for. Fellas, where are the watchmen on the walls? 